Welcome to the District Architecture Center and our series on the giants of Washington architecture. I'm Mary Fitch and today I get to do one of my favorite things. I, I'm going to be talking to an architect about his work and his influences and uh, I get to talk to one of my favorite people, Coke Florence, FAIA. Coke is a multiple award winner for his uh, design work as well as his work in the community and you've won the award, uh, the highest award the chapter can bestow, the Centennial Medal, so you've done quite a lot in your life. So my first question to you, Coke, is why architecture? Why did you study architecture? Why did you want to become an architect? Well, that's an interesting question. I uh, like to draw, and that was clear in art class in high school and so forth. But I came from, uh, I descended from artistically gifted people. My grandfather was a painter who painted in uh, uh, Brittany oh. uh, in the uh, teens uh, and New Manet. Uh, and my father, who was uh, an executive with a telephone company, actually was a gifted ar uh, artist himself, beautiful pen and ink drawings. Uh, he felt that my grandfather had used up all the family money so that it was important if you wanted to be artistic to find a job that could combine both. And he felt a little sorry, I think, in retrospect, that he, as an executive in a phone company didn't have that crossover anyhow so he looked at me and he said why don't you try architecture a thought that had never crossed my mind I did and I found they gave you grades for drawing pictures <laughs> and everything else has just been terrific and I've loved my career great you started your career in Washington in 1960 you were you were practicing here yeah. Um, and who were the big architects in Washington at that time? Well, at that point, there were two leading firms. Uh, both were traditionalist. Uh, one was Faulkner, Kingsbury, and Stenhouse. The other, not so traditionalist, in fact, was Berla and Abel. And you may remember Jesse Weinstein, uh -huh. and you know his daughter, Amy, Amy Weinstein. Yeah. He later became a partner in that firm. Uh, but in those days, it was hard to find a firm practicing contemporary architecture, as we called it at that point, and that's what I wanted. I was lucky enough to have gotten a summer job before going off in the Navy for four years with uh, Kai Smith Satterley Francis D. Lethbridge Associate Good gravy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> exactly. So when I came back from the Navy, uh, Clothiel Smith, uh, a firm then was Satterley and Smith, they had broken apart, uh, was the first to hire me. So your, your interest in contemporary architecture, you still wanted to practice in Washington, even though uh, Washington in that time might not have been, as you said, uh, there weren't that many contemporary architects. Yeah, I architects. was deeply rooted as, as a native uh, in Washington, all my friends were here, so on and so forth, and I was quite certain that uh, I could uh, have a satisfactory career in spite of the sort of tension in those days between traditional and modern. But I've, as you know, that evaporated. So uh, it's been a, a, a great run. Yeah, you don't see that tension anymore between, um, between traditional and modern? No, I think where traditional is now practiced, uh, it's done by experts who are interesting people with strong points of view. Hmm. And I think it's more a philosophical and stylistic difference. Wow. Okay. I wanted to ask you, do you think over your career there, there is a Florence style? Do you have a, do you have a style, of a particular detail that you can point to? Actually, I don't. I kind of wish I could, but I don't. Uh, my practice has always been collegial with bright young people working with me. Uh, I have been more, if you will, an editor-in-chief. Uh, but there is an overlaying uh, stylistic approach, which for lack of a better word, I would call contextualism. And in the 70s, uh, that was a term that was being used to some extent in the uh, journals and so forth. You and I once had an argument about a building. Do you remember the Sunderland building on um, 19th Street? Yes. And I uh, was quoted as saying it was a hulking building. 
and what uh, was actually, it was a jury that said that, not me, but you really took me to task for that. Tell me a little bit about um, that building and why it so offended you that it was, it was referred to that way. Well, in those days, I was working for Kai's, Lethbridge, and Condon, the occupants of that building, and designed by Arthur Kai's. New brutalism is much more like the FBI building. And if you talk about hulking, I think it hulks. But the Sunderland Place building, in my judgment, is refined with a good scale of window openings, subtleties, the slants on the window openings uh, were designed to receive the sun uh, and the sun's direction. And uh, I always thought, and I think we all thought, that it was uh, basically pretty delicate, and it wasn't too tall, and it wasn't too massive. And yeah. so you were wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I am glad to be wrong. And in fact, after that conversation, I, I, I went and looked at the building quite a lot. And one of the things that um, people sometimes say about buildings, particularly along K Street, is that they're like skyscrapers with the tops cut off because of our height limit. People aren't really right. building within that high limit. They're just kind of building up and, and, and lopping off the top. The, the Sunderland building does not do that. It is, a whole, it is a whole piece of work. It is a whole work of yes. art. Yes, that's yeah. a good point, well yeah. phrased. So talk a little bit about the Greyhound building and some of your other projects that are your favorites and how, how you've managed to be contextual but also uh, be rather bold in some of your work. So what you see there is a building which has some modeling on the face and on the massing which is, uh, gives it scale and is not inconsistent with the modeling, if you will, of the little uh, landmark structure. But then the, the facade treatment, the materials, uh, are very distinctly uh, uh, Art Deco. And most of the credit for that building, going back to the notion that I was editor-in-chief, mm -hmm. uh, goes to Phil Esikoff. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And who, Phil's uh, known for all his wavy brick buildings, exactly. like the one above us. Exactly, yeah. and he's, uh, he was influenced by the Barcelona Modistas. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, that's great. We had a conversation a little while ago about the design center in right. Southwest, which um, when that was put into Southwest, that was an old refrigeration plant, right? It was a refrigerated warehouse yeah. where meat would be taken yeah. in by a train that came off the train tracks down there on a spur and went right through the middle of the building. Good gravy. And they let, they took off the big hunks of meat. It must be like the meat packing district in New York and the High Line. Right, right. And uh, so uh, the, uh, so we converted that into a design center. And uh, the interesting thing along the way was that the building was frozen and the structural engineer was concerned about what happens to a frozen building when it melts? Answer, nothing. Oh, good. Good to know. <laughs> um, but that, that building was a really um, forward-thinking building. That part of the city was really, uh, there wasn't much right. going on there at all. And so that really kind of was a catalyst for the redevelopment of that part of the city. Right. And now that project is gone. Yes. Um, and overtaken by another project from your firm, uh, the Bible Museum. The Bible Museum. And, yes. and how does it feel that this project that you kind of gave your heart and soul to, that is one of your children perhaps, is, is now overtaken by another? Well, first of all, we always need another project. <laughs> so that feels good. <laughs> Secondly, uh, as you know, buildings, uh, and the city adapt and change and grow and so forth. Uh, the business model evidently for the design center had deteriorated. Uh, and uh, a uh, broker who was trying to help the museum find a site came to us and asked us to help them look for a site. And we looked at this and we looked at that and uh, the <laughs> Uh, client was interested in being as close as possible to the mall, mm. but was concerned uh, because of uh, uh, the religious component uh, not to appear 
too close to them all. Right. I think you can understand that. Certainly. Uh, and so that building turned up. And I don't know if you've seen any of the sketches for it, but it really has turned uh, into a, a very intriguing design with a curved glass top floor added. And uh, it's going to be uh, dynamite. And uh, here again, the editor in chief, this is David Greenbaum's right. conception. Right. And David in our firm has been responsible for some of the national honor awards that we have right, received. Right, right, the Normandy Museum, all those exactly. beautiful, beautiful things. That's great. So you're helping to influence people but like David and Sven and others yeah. at, at, at the at Smith Group. Who influenced you? Who, 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 whose work were you following when you were younger? From the standpoint of practicing architecture and living life, uh, Don Lethbridge was uh, uh, my principal mentor. I came in with the idea that there might be some work that we could do for suburban storage units. And he looked at me and he said, Coke, this is not a crap factory. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Take me back to what it was like to practice architecture in the 1960s. I mean, I sort of have this madman view of, um, of what it might have been like. I mean, certainly it wasn't as electronic. Nobody talked to each other on cell phones. The fax machines weren't, weren't even probably a big deal then. And were the three martini lunches that I always hear about really true? Uh, to some extent, they were. Uh, How did anyone get anything done? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but we did. <laughs> Uh, both, all three, Kai's, Lethbridge, Condon, uh, were members of the Cosmos Club, and our office uh, on DuPont Circle was close. Mm -hmm. So uh, every once in a while, they would invite me to join them for lunch. And uh, uh, most often, uh, two cocktails were uh, consumed at lunch, and then we'd go back, and as though nothing had happened, we'd practice for the rest of the afternoon. I can't explain it, but we never had the sense that we were impaired. If I tried to do that again today, it would be impossible. The other thing in those days was, by and large, didn't work. It was a different world. And so we had that sort of support system at home, particularly with reference to the kids. We had no computers, but to do our drawings, to make presentations to our clients and to the review groups, we had to stay up all night uh, and uh, render them with colored pencils, so on and so forth. And so it was intensive. How do you see the profession of architecture progressing in DC and what do, you, what do you hope for them? For really successful architecture, you need to have a willing client, a forward-looking client. And so uh, what happened in Washington in the 70s and 80s is that the big law firms started coming here and they were totally unsatisfied with the uh, stock of office buildings. And so that raised the bar a lot. And of course, it raised the bar for the architects because they were, we had to learn mm -hmm. and, and do that. So that was good. Uh, and uh, whether that's gonna continue in terms of what the architectural programs are going to be uh, remains to be seen but it's very uh, important because without uh, a demanding program and client uh, for significant commercial buildings, uh, it's hard for the, uh, for the architect to impose his will, I hate to admit that, uh, on uh, a client who's not interested in anything too good. But there weren't any like star architects, uh, or no. there wasn't a Frank Gehry or a Zaha. We had no, no, you're okay. quite right. And right. Washington, unfortunately, has not had any star architects. Well, maybe, I don't know, it, it, it may be that we've had these great people that can do really good work and they don't need to be we've rock stars. <laughs> your giants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. My giants, exactly. Well, Coke, thanks so much for talking with me today. This has been a really, really delightful and 
um, I think you still, uh, you're still influencing um, Washington in a big way because there's so many people at Smith Group who, uh, who really admire your work and have been coached by you and as you call yourself the editor-in-chief, I know that so many people have really owed their careers to you. Well, thank you very much and I have to say I'm flattered. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Giants of Washington Architecture.